Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Raul Shoneman. I'm a clinical professor here at the University of Texas with the Capital Punishment Clinic. It's my pleasure, uh, privilege, uh, to moderate uh, the concluding panel of this, uh, I think, truly uh, remarkable symposium we've been conducting for the last two uh, days. Uh, and our, our panel discussion is about 21st challenges to the death penalty. Uh, my colleague, Jordan Steiker, began this conference by quoting Shakespeare's uh, line from The Tempest, uh, what's past is prologue, and the panelists that have preceded us have reflected on the uh, past 40 years of the American death penalty uh, from virtually every dimension. Uh, with that as our prologue, uh, the task of this panel discussion this morning is to explore where our experience with the American death penalty may go from here. Um, I'm joined on this stage by uh, three capital defense practitioners, one a uh, hybrid capital defense practitioner scholar, um, and uh, who are actively involved in formulating and litigating uh, innovative uh, contemporary, contemporary, contemporary challenges uh, to the death penalty. Um, to my far right, or your, from your vantage point far right, uh, is Jen Moreno. She's a staff attorney uh, with the Berkeley Law Death Penalty Clinic. Uh, and since 2007, her work has focused on challenges to lethal injection, uh, and she's consulted with attorneys litigating lethal injection challenges in more than 20 states. Uh, to Jen's right and your left uh, is Catherine Case. She's the executive director of the uh, Texas Defender Service, uh, probably familiar to everybody here who is from Texas, the nonprofit law office uh, that is engaged in uh, death penalty representation efforts at reform. Uh, she's also one of the attorneys who has represented Scott Panetti, uh, which involved a successful challenge to uh, competency, uh, Texas's procedures for determination of competency to be executed, and is also representing Dwayne Buck, uh, who uh, has a pending uh, petition for certiorari presently in the Supreme Court, challenging the admission of uh, expert testimony that uh, Mr. Buck was dangerous by virtue of his race. And uh, to my left, and uh, again to your right, from your vantage point, is Rob Smith. He's a professor at the University of North Carolina. He is a visiting scholar this semester, this year, at the University of Texas. He's uh, also currently the litigation director of the Eighth Amendment Project, um, which has been described on the Internet as the most ambitious effort yet to abolish the death penalty. Uh, before we begin, I just want to let you know that uh, we are going to reserve half an hour of our time uh, to uh, engage in a discussion with you to solicit your input on this topic. We know, uh, first of all, we know acutely know that we are, have no uh, monopoly on the ideas for 21st century challenges to the death penalty. It's a subject that many of you are actively engaged in litigating and thought about and written about. So we were eager to uh, not just talk at you, but to, to hear from you as well. Uh, and so we will reserve 30 minutes uh, to solicit your input on the question. So uh, we've already lived through the first 15 years of the 21st century, and uh, uh, there have been a number of surprising developments that have really changed the course uh, of the death penalty in the new century. Uh, perhaps one of the most surprising de developments of the past decade has been the effect of sustained challenges to lethal injection procedures. Um, and I say that it's, I, I consider it surprising in part because there's really no Supreme Court precedent that the, at least uh, there's no Supreme Court precedent in which the court has found any mode of procedure uh, or method of, of uh, imposing, the ex uh, imposing the death penalty is unconstitutional. Um, and yet, um, and, and yet uh, contemporary challenges to, to lethal injection have had a surprising degree of, of uh, uh, success in stalling executions in a number of states in the federal, in the federal government. Um, and, uh, and, and I think we want, I would like to ask um, Jen um, to, this, to tell us, as a, our resident expert on lethal injection challenges, why is it that lethal injection has been successful in stalling executions uh, for a lengthy period in some jurisdictions uh, and less successful in others? Uh, and what do you foresee uh, lies ahead uh, in this area? I mean, I think that, can, is there, can people hear? Okay. So I think that there's a couple of reasons why um, it, this litigation and, and the things that have gone on around the litigation have been both successful and unsuccessful. And I'm going to start off by saying, and then come back to it um, sort of as I go through a bit, 
um, that I think that the main reason why things have been both successful and unsuccessful have to do with transparency and what we know about what states are doing and how they are carrying out executions, where they're getting drugs, who's doing it. And so I think that the, to the degree that a state is transparent or not transparent has a lot to do with um, how efficiently they can carry out executions. Um, and I think that we've seen executions on hold for a number of reasons. Um, after Bayes, uh, cert was granted in Bayes in 2007, um, we saw everyone on hold for about seven months. Um, and that's because at that time, everyone was using the same combination of drugs to carry out executions. So the Supreme Court was re reviewing that combination, and no one could carry out executions until um, you know, they had issued their opinion. We saw after Bayes a quick resumption by a number of states. Um, and a handful of those states carried out a few executions, and then we haven't seen them execute anyone since. Um, other states like Texas, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma have just sort of gone through it, um, you know, since then. Glossop was similar, but different because similar in the fact that every state that was using or wanting to use the method being reviewed by the court um, couldn't do so in the four months, six months that the court um, was reviewing that. Um, but there was a handful of states, Georgia, Texas, Missouri, who were still carrying out executions using a different method, single drug method, um, and they carried out, I think, a dozen executions in the six months between cert grant and um, the, issue of the issuing of the opinion. So I think that that's, you know, we saw the nationwide stoppage for that reason, um, the court's review. Um, you know, we've seen here and there federal courts stopping executions in a certain state. Um, it's been a really long time since a federal court um, findings held up an execution in any state, or held up executions in any state um, on, a, on a large scale basis, really since before Bayes. Um, the federal courts have not found constitutional violations um, in any state, in any case, um, since Bayes. But I think that the reason that we're seeing in other states has to do with state law. And it has to do with state law that hold the departments accountable for a number of different reasons. So. For example, we saw executions on hold in Arkansas for a long time. They haven't executed anyone in over 10 years. Um, they've had really successful state court litigation having to do with the separation of powers. And the courts there finding a few times that the regulations um, and the department's decisions um, exceeded the separation, uh, exceeded the, the grant, um, the discretion that they had to develop the protocol. And so they were exceeding that. And and, and so it's, it's a law about accountability, that we have unelected agency officials making big decisions that should have been left to the legislature. So we've seen things on hold there. You know, California and a handful of other states are subject to the Administrative Procedures Act, um, which is a public process for developing regulations. No state that's had to go through administrative procedures has been able to resume executions. And we're talking about a finding that New Jersey had to go through it. They ended up, you know, abolishing the same thing with Maryland. Kentucky hasn't been able to resume execution since they had to go through APA rulemaking. California, Nebraska. Um, and so, you know, it's when we see that there are, there has to be public participation or transparency in a process of what a state is doing, that's when we start to see some of the problems, you know, with this. And we, we saw Kaczynski yesterday talk about how, you know, lethal injection, there's a lot of problems with it. And secrecy has always been a problem with how states carry out executions. It just happened to be before the secrecy was what were they were doing? What was the administration? Who was carrying it out? Um, what kind of problems were there? And only through litigation in the early years of this, so 2002, four, five, six, did we start to see, oh, well, incompetent people are carrying this out. And people who are untrained and people don't care and it's careless. And we saw some stoppage of executions for those reasons by federal courts. So once we saw what was going on and there was an examination, we had to put things on hold in order to, to evaluate whether or not what states were doing was constitutional. And the same thing is sort of going on now with drug shortage. Say what you want, people differ on the reasons why there are drug unavailabilities. We don't need to debate that right now. Um, it's a fact. States are having a hard time getting drugs. And so in order to protect their sources, they've had to manufacture secrecy in the form of state statutes, um, applying existing statutes to things that they are 
newly doing, like we saw in Missouri, try to make the pharmacist a member of the execution team, so they were covered by existing statute. Um, and what that's done is allow those states to hide potentially reckless or dangerous practices, uh, practices that don't comply with the law. Getting drugs from compounding pharmacies does not comply with the law. And what secrecy statutes are permitting states like Georgia and Missouri and Texas to do is, in essence, violate the law in order to uphold the law. And so, you know, I think it has a lot to do with what we know, and when states have to do it out in the open, we are seeing the problems. We are seeing that carrying out executions is not as easy as we thought it was. And as a result of that, um, you know, places where that has to be done in the open, you know, they're not able to. It's more difficult to resume them. One of the things we're seeing with uh, as a, um, a response, essentially, to I think the success of, of the lethal of lethal in injection challenges, some of the problems with botched executions, uh, is a backlash in the states. Um, uh, they're responding to this essentially now by reinst reinstating, reinstituting uh, modes of punishment that I think we all thought were outdated and less humane. Uh, Utah legislature last year reinstated uh, the firing squad. Uh, the Virginia legislature is, is presently entertaining legislation to reinstate the electric chair. Um, and I guess I, my question is sort of where, where do we see this all leading? I think when, when the first lethal injection challenges were, were brought 10 or 15 years of contemporary lethal injection challenges, uh, many, I put myself in this, in this group, thought that where these challenges could at best lead were to uh, kinder and gentler ways of executing people. Um, and now there's also the possibility they may be leading toward less kind and gentle ways uh, of executing people. So to what extent uh, is that the next frontier uh, of... Uh, challenges to mode of execution. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's an interesting point. And, and even before we start to think about um, alternative methods, we have to think about drug combinations. So are the fact that states are having to scramble and pick whatever they can get their hands on, is that, are, you know, is that leading to more risky than, you know, practices than, you know, otherwise there would be, um, you know, perhaps. But I think that the alternative methods sort of fits a couple of days ago in the prosecutor's panel. Um, I think one of the former Texas prosecutors said something like, Texas is able to do this because the people, the leadership, as he called them, um, they're taking steps to make sure that Texas can do this. And that has to do with passing secrecy statutes so that they can continue to get drugs from wherever they need to. I think that what we're seeing in some of these states passing alternative methods or going back to alternative methods is sort of similar. At least the legislature's there. I don't know about the departments or, or how it's going to, you know, at the point at which they will actually carry out executions using this method. But they want to preserve their ability to carry out executions. And if they have to go back to the electric chair, that's just indicative of how badly states might, you know, the states want to carry out executions, or at least how badly legislatures want to make, have the appearance that they can carry out executions. And whether or not Tennessee carries out electric uh, executions by the electric chair, or Oklahoma has to use gas, or Utah uses a firing squad, I think is going to have a lot to do with, um, you know, what the executive branches in those states are willing to do, what the public is willing to put up with. You know, how the media reports this has been huge in calling attention to, you know, these issues. So it, it, it's a similar, I think, spectrum of desperation on the part of the states. I want to I invite Catherine and Rob to, to chime in on your thoughts about um, whether sort of the, the, this area of litigation and the really horrifically botched recent executions in, in Oklahoma in Lock, Lock, Clayton Lockett's case last year and Joseph Wood in Arizona, whether these are raising sort of larger questions about the death penalty beyond the question about lethal injection, just whether they are unsettling people uh, because it is, it is leading states to essentially go backwards uh, toward outmoded, outdated uh, uh, what well, we, we thought until recently were obsolete uh, methods of execution. Is this leading, in other words, and contributing uh, to uh, the direction of abolition? I think it is. I think, though, that the, 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 the space that it creates is not always in the way that you expect. Um, 
So the space that it creates, uh, a judge may say, you know, I don't, I, I can't really rule that the death penalty is unconstitutional based on a lethal injection method because we're at a trial level and in Texas it's not ripe to litigate this at the trial level. Um, but we, we may have judges who do signal, you know, um, I'm really interested in hearing more about extending Atkins to people with mental illness or um, fighting to um, expand the upper limit of the IQ score that qualifies someone for a finding of intellectual disability or litigating to expand um, the age of onset, which is you've got to have intellectual disability onset before the age of 18, although we know that brain development continues well into the 20s and in some people into the th early 30s. Um, and we also know that people who are, say, brain injured after the age of 18 don't, and yet, and suffer, suffer cognitive decline as a result, don't fit within Atkins as intellectual disability is currently defined, and yet shouldn't they be protected? Or say if somebody had Lewy body dementia, would we really want that person eligible for the death penalty? So I think we, this creates spaces in our litigation at trial to, to litigate and, and where you're successful, you know, the case doesn't go forward. So let me, you know, give you an example of space for litigation. Uh, several years ago, members of this death penalty clinic, including Robert Owen, were successful in getting Jonathan Bruce Reed a new trial um, in Dallas. And there, was, there is significant evidence that Mr. Reed is innocent of this capital murder. Uh, when he finally went back for retrial, they did all this DNA testing and they, of, of the sheets of the dead woman and discovered a lot of other men's DNA, but not Mr. Reed's significantly. And since he was alleged to have sexually assaulted her and murdered her, that would seem significant that his DNA was not present. Um, it apparently was not significant to the Dallas County District Attorney, um, who was then Craig Watkins because he went forward with a death penalty prosecution. Um, but what also turned out was that in the intervening 30 years since his initial conviction in this retrial, virtually every family member or knowledgeable person who could talk about his life history, which as we all know is very significant, to the life or death decision when you get to punishment, was dead. And the one remaining family member, who was a distant relative, lived in a nursing home in the Midwest and was rapidly declining from age-related dementia. So she wasn't going to be available to testify. So the defense team took, and the judge was signaling, he was having trouble with this case. Um, because of the DNA testing, which the defense was making you know, him aware of. And so there was this really unprecedented hearing in Texas where the defense team and experts put on in a combination of open and a closed hearing, because some of this was privileged material that could only go in ex parte and under seal, about the inability of the defense to put on a mitigation case because of the passage of time. And the trial judge, throughout the death penalty, said, state, you can't seek the death penalty because of the inability to, to put on this life history evidence. And the state said, we're going to mandamus you. We're going to appeal to the Court of Criminal Appeals. And it took some time, but they did appeal. And the Court of Criminal Appeals overturned the decision and said, you know, Judge, you don't have the authority to do this. And by the way, we haven't had the trial yet, notwithstanding that we'd had two prior trials. We all knew what was going to happen. Um, but we haven't had a trial yet, so we don't know how this is really going to affect the jury and going to affect that life or death decision making. So it's not right. And the case came back, and the state realized, holy crap, if we get a death sentence in this case, this issue is now going to be front and center on appeal. And we're not going to be able to retain this. And so in the end, the state withdrew its death notice. Um, now, Mr. Reed was still convicted uh, because they didn't withdraw the death notice until after they had chosen a death qualified jury. Um, you yourselves are free to think whatever you want to think about the prosecution team in that case. Um, I have my own thoughts, which I won't share with you here, but, um, but I think that that's an example of how this litigation and this continue or this continued discussion about the viability of the death penalty creates space. In the most successful cases, as Dana Lynn Reeser told you on the first day, this litigation means that those cases don't go forward as death cases. They get settled, they get pled out, 
Um, and so that's part of the problem, you know, in terms of whole scale challenges at the trial level. If you're really good, you make the case go away. First of all, I would just, I don't know how to use a microphone. Can people hear me? <laughs> I, showing incompetence at the very first moment is always a, is always a good thing. Um, first of all, I would say uh, just thanks to Jen Moreno, Megan McCracken, and, and Liz Semmel, and the Berkeley Lethal Injection uh, Clinic has been some of the most important and impactful work on the death penalty in the last, you know, since Greg uh, and uh, Dale Bache, who's in this room, and others. <laughs> I think that this is, it helps to think about what's happening with lethal injection in a broader context, right? The fight over the end of the death penalty, um, and I really do believe we're at the end stages of the death penalty, and the fight over the end of the death penalty is really a political fight. Even if you think that this fight ends in the United States Supreme Court and not a legislature, right? Um, this is a political fight. And, and, and what I mean by that is that we, for so long, the defense community, right, in, in the 80s and, and the 90s, we were dealing with, you know, the super predator myths and crack babies and three strikes laws and the climate in the United States was squarely against criminal justice reform and the death penalty community like the rest of the criminal justice community, we're on defense. And I think what you see with lethal injection is this political shift. It is offense, right? And, and let me, this is why I think it's so powerful. Whether or not we ever win in court saying you can't execute when has this kind of risk of harm, which I think it should happen, but the United States Supreme Court, at least so far, um, has, has not gone in that direction, right? But regardless of whether you actually win on that claim, um, what it's doing is incredible, right? Uh, Justice Alito called it guerrilla war uh, warfare. Um, really unclear when it's like, you know, instead of a prosecutor saying, I'm running because we're going to execute this person, or hey, I'm going to, we're, we're kill this guy's King Kong or beast of burden talking about a, a defendant, uh, right? And instead of the prosecutor running on how we like to kill people, it's this cultural shifts happening. We're saying, wait a minute, like, how are we killing people? Like, it used to be that people were being burned alive in an electric chair, and now we're going through with these lethal injections, and we're finally litigating and saying, what is the state doing? Can you imagine any other kind of regulation where we don't know how the state is operating in this most basic way, where the state can just say, hey, let's be secret? It just wouldn't happen, right? The F like, can you imagine transportation? Like, you're like, well, you know, really important that we want to keep this quiet. We, it's just unimaginable, right? And so we're starting to learn this information, and what we're learning is that the state is totally incompetent in the way that they're able to handle it in most states in America that still have the death penalty. And what, what, what happens, what, you know, this guerrilla warfare is one of these major companies. And, and, you know, let's be honest, like most pharmaceutical companies, now they get some, like, they're not like, ble like I, I would guess the percentage of people voting for Bernie Sanders, who's on a board at one of those major pharmaceutical companies, isn't like astronomically high. And these companies are like, it's hard to imagine that they're like, you know, um, we could make millions of dollars off this and really please the people of America if we just keep saying, sending drugs there. But these damn powerful abolitionists with all their money and organized support and influence have stopped us from doing it. It's total crap, right? What happened was they're like, this is not good for business because when the people of America learn that when you try to execute people, sometimes they are, they are tortured in the process. It's not good for business because when we see how the death penalty actually operates, we do do not like it, all right? And that's offense. And you look at places like Utah, and you say, "Well, we're pretty close in Utah. We have the abolition, or uh, uh, we have, you know, the firing squad in Utah." There are two votes away from abolishing the death penalty in Utah, replacing the death penalty with an alternative punishment in the state of Utah this year, last month, right? Um, in Virginia, if they sign the bill, if, if Governor McCall signs the bill, right, uh, and we have the electric chair. In Virginia, let's think about this for a second. The state of Georgia, the Georgia Supreme Court, not known for its liberal tendencies, the Georgia Supreme Court has said the death penalty, if you're trying to implement it by means of the electric chair, is unconstitutional, right? And 
the Nebraska Supreme Court's like, we, this looks really unconstitutional to us, right? Is that really, are we really, is Governor McAuliffe going to sign a war and actually electrocute somebody? People are burned alive, not to mention a completely racist history around the death penalty and the electric chair and Virginia. And so when you start to implement these alternative punishments, right, and, and these alternative methods, and then you actually have to implement them, that is not a conversation that the people of Virginia or, or Oklahoma, where, where, where the this litigation in Oklahoma has literally shut down the death penalty system as it should have there, and people are asking fundamental questions. And you look at some of the surveys of the people in Oklahoma about this question, and they are really surprising results because the people of Oklahoma do not like the way that their Department of Corrections has handled the lethal injection process, and it's making them think twice about whether executions are really something that comports with their standards of decency, not in Vermont or Maine or New Hampshire or Massachusetts, but in Oklahoma and in Georgia and in Nebraska. That's offense, and that's some of the most incredible, impactful work that's happened in the last 40 years. I asked whether, whether the panelists thought that lethal injection was leading in the direction of abolition, and I think Rob answered the question loud and clear. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I hope that my question wasn't, wasn't interpreted to mean that I didn't feel similarly. Um, I think it's my, my job to throw out the questions. Um, I wanted to turn, actually, to uh, you know, a really fundamental issue of uh, the persistence of race discrimination and administration of the death penalty and sort of contemporary challenges that can be formulated post McCluskey given the impediment that McCluskey poses to, to such challenges. And I, I also specifically was interested in your responses to the fact that there's really now a, a really robust uh, body of empirical research on the pervasiveness of implicit bias. Uh, and the way it may influence uh, not only uh, the sentencer's discretion, but prosecutorial discretion, um, which has largely been insulated from any sort of constraint or review. Um, and I wanted to just, uh, Rob, I think you've written about the uh, impact of implicit bias on the exercise of prosecutorial discretion. And I want to solicit the, the input from the other panelists as well. Uh, but I mean, what, what are uh, the ways in which we may be able to draw on that research, if there are some, uh, in formulating uh, new contemporary challenges to race discrimination in, in, the, in the death penalty. After I just got done yelling, I'm, you know, I'm trying to <laughs> find my inside voice, but it's just so hard for me. Um, so what we, we, in two different studies, one that's published and one that hasn't been published yet, uh, my colleagues and I, let's be honest, all of them much more competent with uh, social science message, uh, methods than I am. Uh, but uh, we, we wanted to see, like, you have these, in McCluskey, you have these race of victim effects, right, where you, where you see, like, if you kill a white person, you're much more likely uh, to be sentenced to death. And then if you, uh, Mona Lynch and, and Craig Haney and others have said, if you really narrow it down and just look at the cases that go to trial and have a phase where we decide, are we going to give you a life sentence or are we going to give you a death sentence, you see some race of defendant effects in there, where, where being a, a, a black uh, defendant um, is likely to influence your odds at trial. And so what we're trying to do is say, like, it, give a partial answer of why might that happen, right? And so in the first study, we, uh, we had people, uh, implicit association tests it's called, and it measures the associations between, like for example, a, a face, right? A white face or a black face, and then a concept. And so here, and usually it's good or bad, right? A, a weapon or, 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 or non-weapon. And so what we did is we created what we called an implicit value of life test. And so we said, um, when you, would you more quickly, right, associate words that connote value um, with a white face and words that connote a lack of value, expendable, right, with a black face. And it turns out the answer to that question, at least in our study of 600 people from uh, six of the leading death penalty states in America, is yes. People tend to associate white faces with words that connote value and black faces with words that don't connote value. And then if we death qualify those, those jurors, those participants, all of them jury eligible, um, what you see is that um, the process of death qualification aggravates the effect. So the people who actually serve on the jury have higher associations between white and this concept of value uh, relative to black and the concept of, of expendability, right? And, um, and so we dug deeper, and, and in Lockhart, and I don't want to 
open any old wounds for people in this room that might or might not have argued Lockhart in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. But um, uh, in Lockhart, right, I think one of the arguments, and there's nothing there, was, well, when you eliminate these people from a jury, it's not like eliminating black people. I mean, it's like you're just eliminating, like, death-qualified people. It's not a class of people that you're eliminating. And what our research found was actually the entire explanation for why people in the, in the death-qualified jury poll are more likely uh, to associate white with relative to value is because we're eliminating black and brown people from the jury pool. Um, and so that, that explained a, 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 almost all of, of the effect. Um, and so then that made us think, well, like if there is this, like that helps explain it. Like what justifies the death penalty? When the U.S. Supreme Court looks at the death penalty today in Atkins and Roper and, uh, and in Graham, the nonviolent life without court, all these cases are about retribution, right? I'm like, well, you know, is there something, there's just this big history between race and retribution in, the, in this country, right? Um, the, 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 the idea for the need for, for lynching in, in the 1920s in Louisiana when there was this idea of we should get rid of the death penalty, the newspapers were like, no, 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 it's not that we like the death penalty. It's that if we get rid of the death penalty, we're going to have more lynchings because, like, the white people need a way to get out their their vengeance, and it's better to go through the justice system, right? Or Donnie Myers last week had a conviction reversed in South Carolina because he called the defendant an ape and a beast of burden, right? Uh, and King Kong. And so, you're like, there's this, this real link here. And so we created another implicit association test, and the study's not uh, is not published yet because we're too incompetent to get it out in the law review window. But, like, um, so stay Jude. But what we did is we created another asso implicit association test that tried to show, like, is white is retribution itself a raced concept? The actual concept of retribution, right? And so um, it turns out that people associate um, black faces more with the need or the perceived need for retribution than white faces with the perceived need for retribution. Conversely, associate white faces with the, with the concepts that convey the need for uh, redemption relative to, uh, to black faces. And those results actually predict your overall attitudes towards whether or not you believe re um, re retribution is, is, the, is the most important uh, punishment rationale. And so I think what that does for us is not necessarily get us back to a place where you can win on like McCluskey grounds, but when the court looks at the death penalty and says, is this serving a retributive purpose? Justice Kennedy said, well, any time you use retribution, even though it's the most important, you risk descent into brutality, right? That, that you're contravening the law's own ends. And, and I think when you see these pers persistent race disparities and then you look at retribution, I, I, I think the, the, the link between retribution and race is so tight that that's what I mean by politically. You might not see it in the doctrine or the case itself, but what we're doing is showing that when you look at the death penalties, these disparities aren't just because they're happenstance, they're legacies of the way that we've organized our society, and in a lot of places that use it today, they are badges of racism, and they're so tied in with the actual concept that we want to make the death penalty look like it actually is. It, it's, it's gross. It, it's when you kill people when they're burning alive, or, or when, when, when you kill people and, and you look at the Houston statistics and they're all black, that, that's not something you want to be part of. That's something that the country has, has moved away from. Catherine, you have the cert petition in Buck pending before the Supreme Court. Do you want to comment on, on how you see race coming into play in, in future Supreme Court decisions potentially? Well, and I've been thinking about Buck in the context of going back and reading Jurek and, um, you know, in, in Jurek, which was, was, of course, the companion case to Greg, uh, one aspect of the litigation was this impossibility of predicting future violence as a result of the future danger question. And what we have in Texas is a history, it, and, and you we'll see it in virtually every case where there is a death sentence, where the state argues for a death sentence based on an immutable characteristic of the defendant. So in cases where the defendant is young, the state will argue, well, see, he's youth, and you, he's, he's got this, you know, he's, he's youthful, so you can take into account the fact that he'll be on in the prison system a very long time for the rest of his life, and he can be dangerous during that period. All right? So this is this immutable characteristic that he comes to the table with, and they're arguing for death based on youth. Or we see this um, Randall Mays, who's a mentally, wildly mentally ill man on death row, um, who had several diagnoses um, when he hit trial, and the state argued for death based on his mental illness and said, you can take that diagnosis and find that he will be more dangerous in the future. 
I mean, that is outrageous. And so then we have Dwayne Buck, um, where um, the defense called an expert witness. Um, Mr. Buck had killed two people in a drug and alcohol fueled episode, his ex-girlfriend and her new lover, and then he shot his half-sister who survived. Um, and the, and the, the expert was putatively called by the defense to say that, well, he'd examined Mr. Buck's background and history and he would not pose a future danger and so therefore the jury shouldn't find him to be a future danger and or sentence him to death. The problem was the expert had decided as part of his analysis that because there were more blacks and Hispanics in the Texas prison system relative to their representation in the population, so he's looking at percentages, that, well, um, there was an, a race of, of offender effect. Now, I don't know how this expert sort of missed, like, the lecture on other influences that put black and brown people in the prison system, you know, beyond any capacity for offending, um, you know, at a, at a greater rate than white people. I, I really don't. I can't account for that. I can't account for how the defense apparently missed that lecture too. Um, so they they submit a report from him, um, but the but the prosecutor, because they know who this expert is, they know very clearly that for him race is an issue, and they so it comes out on direct that race is a factor he takes into account. Well, the the prosecutor amplifies it on cross and then uses it in her closing argument to argue for a finding of future danger based on this immutable characteristic, which is Mr. Buck's race. And the other thing I'd like to just point out here, the fact that we have discovered in our own mitigation investigation, not discovered by the original defense team, is that Mr. Buck's great-grandparents were slaves in Louisiana. Mr. Buck is very, very dark black man very dark-skinned. Um, it also might help to know the history of Harris County and Southeast Texas with regard to race. The reason there is such a large African-American population in Harris County and Brazoria County and Fort Bend County was because during the Civil War, before the Civil War, slave owners throughout the South sent their property, which we would know to be African-American people, to Southeast Texas, to plantations, to keep that property safe from the Civil War because the theory was that fighting would not reach this far south. When emancipation finally came, or perhaps I should correct myself and say, when word of emancipation finally came to Texas, because we all know it came late, as with most official pronouncements in the East, sometimes even the Supreme Court, um, there was this huge African-American population and, and um, research, a lot of it uh, published by the what's known as the Texas A&M Student Press, shows that um, people were very afraid of this free black population, much of it massed in Houston. Uh, this is when our walled prison system arose, if you've read Texas Tough. It arose in response to this free black population. Um, and the other thing that you need to know about, about Houston itself was allegedly it was illegal to sell to have slave auctions in Houston and Harris County. And yet, slave ships stocked in Galveston and slaves were sold in Houston. Now, if you try and go around and find this history in any one place, it's very, very difficult because we've worked very, very hard to forget it. Um, and I've had to like amass a collection of about 30 books to even get to this very short recitation that I'm giving you here. But when we talk about race, in Harris County, um, suddenly what was done in Mr. Buck's case, it, it isn't isolated, it's not unconnected to the past, it's very much of a piece, but our job is to connect all that up so that a Court of Criminal Appeals, so that a Fifth Circuit and so that a Supreme Court can't say, well, this is just an isolated incident and it really, in the broad scheme of things, as against this man who murdered two people, really means nothing. I think it means quite a bit. And our obligation here in bringing these challenges is, is to connect it to the past. 
um, when I quoted Faulkner the other day about, you know, the past not being dead, I mean, this is, I think, the most important lesson, and we must always bring it into our conversations about race. And so that's my goal with Buck. <laughs> Yeah, of um, just one more thing. I'm sorry. The, um, the I read this article by a, a sociologist at, at Berkeley. I um, think his name is Jerome Carabell, but I might be making that up. Um, he he was talking about the relationship between lynching and um, police killings and the death penalty, and he's saying what what they all have in common is this idea of a complete historical lack of regard for black and brown bodies, right? And at the one thing I think is so important is when you look about the energy and we're at the end of the death penalty, one thing you could do is like be so narrow and say, I'm just going to – we just need to not look at anything else outside the death penalty and just get to the end. But I think it would miss a real opportunity in this country. Uh, uh, last week, the elected prosecutor, Anita Alvarez, lost in Chicago uh, with incredible energy from the non-white community in, in Chicago that took her out of office because they were not only the police shootings that she didn't indict it, but if you look closely at the media coverage and what the people are saying, because Anita Alvarez overpunished people in Chicago, and they made a tight case for why the people who live in the neighborhoods that are being punished the most are the people who are the most disenfranchised and left out of that process. And Anita Alvarez was voted out of office. That same thing happened to Tim McGinty in Cleveland. The same thing happened down in Louisiana in Caddo Parish to, uh, to, to Dale Cox. Uh, and the same thing happened to a prosecutor in Mississippi, a long-term prosecutor. All reform candidates, all people... Uh, 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 one, two, two of them of color saying we need to change the system. And if you look at the overlap today, Radley Belka did an unbelievable, I thought a really awesome piece for the Washington Post, looking at the relationship between police shootings and where they happen in the death penalty and where it's used most. And I guess what I'm trying to say is if we had, like, if, if we could – you know, join that prog. This is really a place where rise. You know, whatever that saying is. You know, um, but but I think the problem is like we can't join in and say like, hey, like we'd really like to be able to steal some of your momentum. Like, like can we? Can we ride along? I, but I, I think that's really a time where if we, I know all of us are so busy, but if we have the capacity to truly engage in the other struggles from people who live in the communities that are the most impacted, that still use the death penalty today, and say, we don't just care about the death penalty, but we want to help you, because we want, we want to be, we want to listen to you and join your voice and be, help to amplify your voice and, and, and be there and listen as you explain how all of these policies of mass incarceration have so affected your communities, I think we'll be able to, 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 to that force together will help us get rid of the death penalty way faster than we can do that by, by working alone. I want to, we're going to try to wrap this up so that we can open it up for uh, comments and questions from the audience, but I wanted to turn, uh, uh, Jen, I'm sorry. No, Are you sure? No, I just want to make sure that, you, okay. Uh, I just want to turn to sort of the, 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 the uh, explicitly the question of abolition. I think that that's been, been basically a subtext of a lot of the presentations, and I, I, will, I will take the liberty of saying that I think that the con it seems to be the emerging consensus of this, of this uh, symposium that we are all headed toward abolition, but the question that we don't know is how we're going to get there and, uh, and when. Um, and, of course, Justice Breyer's dissenting opinion glossop last term uh, you know, essentially is a compendium of all the various challenges uh, to the post Greg death penalty uh, regime that have been advanced over the past 40 years uh, from the persistence of race discrimination, geographic disparities, um, concerns about wrongful convictions, reliability of sentencing procedures, um, and the persistent problems as well with the quality of capital defense representation. The capital defense community, I think, has reacted to Glossop as the second coming of Justice Goldberg's statement in Rudolph in 1963 that presaged uh, the uh, short-lived abolition of the death penalty in 1972 in Furman. And uh, while some of my capital defense colleagues believe that Justice Breyer's descending opinion means that we all should be looking for another line of work in a few years, uh, I am uh, ever the pessimist uh, and uh, am instead reminded of Alan Greenspan's characterization of investors who overreact to momentary price changes as irrational exuberance. Uh, and I'm, I guess I, I ask my, my, my fellow panelists, are we being irrationally exuberant uh, that, that abolition is in the imminent future? Um, and if so, um, to what extent does Justice Breyer's dissent uh, 
uh, constitute essentially a, a blueprint for abolition or arguments for abolition. Well, if you're looking for the, the scene with Margaret Roby in the, in the jacuzzi with the bubble bath, you know, now to explain abolition to you, it's not going to happen. Um, for those of you who, because uh, whenever I think of Greenspan, I, I think of the big short now. Um, and how wrong he was. Exactly. How wrong he was. Um, but I, I think of this, because I'm here in Texas, you know, and with, um, with, with a non-functioning system on a lot of different levels, you know, bad lawyers, not all of them, but a number of them who, who really, and who are under-resourced, um, a, a court system that works very hard to obtain and keep death sentences, um, a legislature that couldn't rush fast enough to eviscerate the Public Information Act, notwithstanding our partnering with the media to oppose that. Um, a federal judiciary that treats this as all in the day's work of denying habeas cases, and a Supreme Court that I think is, you know, interested in correcting the Fifth Circuit, but clearly there might not be enough hours in the day to do that. So I see it as there is space created to talk about this, and, and for those of us on the ground, the important thing is finding those moments in every case to pick your spot. So is it race in your case? Is it mental illness? Is it intellectual disability? Is it the disproportionality that if you're in Hidalgo County, Texas, and you commit capital murder, you're much more likely to face a death prosecution than you might be in even Harris County, Texas, based on the number of murders overall and the cases in which the, the prosecution elects to go forward with the death penalty. You know, so what is your spot? And then you've got to sit there and you've got to litigate it. Um, there is... I think in Texas, sadly, no one-size-fits-all litigation plan. But the good news is we got a lot of stuff to, to choose from. I mean, that's the beauty of it, is that every day there's a new issue, and in every case there's a great angle to work up. And that's what excites me and gets me up in the morning. And, and to say this is an opportunity for creativity and to stop people in their tracks, and particularly judges and prosecutors who say, oh my God, this is really too complicated and I'm going to have to work too hard. How would you like to talk about a plea? Well, I think I might. <laughs> you know, working on a very narrow issue in this, that I, but I think that touches a lot of places and a lot of states, um, and then sort of sitting and listening to y'all and, and the other folks who aren't here now talk over the last few days, it seems like each panel and each person that talks says, when we look at what we're doing, and you're talking about this, like these issues come up in this place and this, and it's opportunity. And when we look at what we're doing, it, whether it's you know race or we look at you know the actions of the prosecution or, or judges perhaps not reviewing things in the way that you know they, they might otherwise if, if the issue was a bit different. Um, you know, I don't know where that gets us in terms of abolition, but I think what it gets us on a case-by-case -case basis or perhaps on a state-by-state -state basis is people don't like what they're seeing. And so, you know, we've always taken it as, in the work that I'm doing, it's our job to show people what's actually happening. And, you know, the media panel talked a lot about how, you know, the increased coverage and the increased interest in this. And, you know, I'll leave it to people like Rob to talk about, you know, what that means in terms of, of of overturning or abolition, but I think that it's working in all of our areas and all of our issues to just say, this is what's happening. Judge, this is what's happening. Media, this is what's happening. You know, public, this is what's happening. And whether or not that's a big issue, you know, sort of like what broader, like what we're, what I'm doing, or specific case by case things, it's that when people see what's happening, they don't like it. And at some point. Um, whether or not that happens on a national level because of something the Supreme Court does or it happens because two more legislatures in the state of Utah don't like what's happening there, it, it, it takes that information and that knowledge about what this looks like on the ground to, to get people across that line. You know, whether it's for an ethical issue or a cost issue or we don't trust our government issue, you know, whatever it is, um, it doesn't matter, like what you said the other day, the reason why. It's just that we get there, um, and, and that's what, what access to information gets us. 
I know you have thoughts on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the first thing I would say is that regardless of what you think of whether or not the court might abolish the death penalty, um, I'm not sure that changes what the most strategic things are to do uh, in the meantime. Um, especially, for example, like, you, you know, in places like Delaware and now Utah and, and in state Supreme Courts like Washington that are considering whether under their state constitution the death penalty is unconstitutional, just heard oral arguments in, in that case, um, like pressing at the state level in places that can be pressed are, 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 are things that make sense. What Catherine and Catherine's team, uh, uh, Randy and, uh, and, and Jessica and others do at the Texas Defender Service, especially in their pre-trial unit, to be able, you know, people say, like, all you need is a, you know, a, a whatever, a beat-up old Chevy Pinto. That's not, you know, you're not entitled to a Cadillac. You need a beat-up Chevy Pinto. It's like, well, like, what... A lot of lawyers have, whether it's because of structural problems like, like funding problems or for whatever other reasons that, that Steve Bright could say more eloquently than I ever could, uh, um, it's not really a, a beat-up Chevy Pinto that we necessarily have in the few counties that have the death penalty. These are people who are saying things like, and I know my friend Larry Hammond knows, in, in Arizona, in Maricopa County, uh, my, my client doesn't look like a, a retard. He looks like a killer. Uh, you have people like Rafiq Eller in Duval County in Florida who have had like, you know, double digit death sentences for their clients and have been reversed multiple times in the last year by the Florida Supreme Court saying um, it's like you had no lawyer at all. Right. And so when when groups like Catherine cases come in and they're able to just help and give time and advice and space at the pretrial level in the places where the death sentences are, ha are happening in the front end, those are the most strategic things people can be doing, regardless of, of, of examples of the most strategic things, regardless uh, of what you believe about um, the outcome with the death penalty. So with that, I would say the irrational exuberance frame, first of all, nobody makes any money betting on the Supreme Court. Um, and if, um, if the lovely folks at WashU and other places who study this uh, from an empirical perspective can't and, and computers can't and Tom Goldstein can't, uh, I, I'm not going to try. Uh, I, but, but what I'm going to tell you is I think how you frame this question matters. And so if you say it's a rational exuberance based on a price point and you look at Glossop's dissent, I think that's a very different framing. Uh, because then you're saying, this is kind of like Furman 2. The problem with Furman 2 is like maybe the way you end it there um, leads to a possible backlash in the states because it sort of creates a conversation. Maybe it can be fixed. Uh, maybe it's on explicit race grounds. Like you have, you have all these broader questions that don't fit the, fit the doctrine. And then you can have, uh, you have a problem where um, it's a liberal, it, 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 it's the four, and then you're like, how, there are not enough you know, liberals on the court, right? Um, I frame it in a different way. Uh, just as Anthony Kennedy said during his confirmation hearing something that, let me tell you, if any person said it, now, I don't, liberal, I don't care if Reagan appointed them to the bench again, like would not con get confirmed. He said um, what the framers had, and you know, he said recently what the framers had in mind to rise above the, the, not the injustice of their own day, but today, and we all get to choose for our own generation. But what he said back in his confirmation hearing was, look, liberty is really a law. It's the law of the Constitution. It, it undergirds uh, everything judges do, and, and judges have to look to the contemporary norms and standards and say, not what happened all the time ago, but today, like, are we unnecessary encroaching upon liberty? And, and he said, that means that judges have the role of, of checking legislative excess, right? Um, and, and then he said, and remember, it's judges, not courts, that brought to you Baker. It's judges, not courts, that brought to you Gideon versus Wainwright. You said that today, you were not getting confirmed on the United States Supreme Court, period, full stop, right? And then you look, and, and it's been Justice Kennedy, who's transformed in the 14th Amendment substantive due process marriage context, has transformed the jurisprudence at a doctrinal level. He is, and in the same way, if you get a, a bigger frame, Justice Kennedy, I think there have been eight or nine, but Eighth Amendment decisions from the Brown versus Platt and Hope versus Pelzer on the prison context, the juvenile life without parole, to the death penalty. Anthony Kennedy has written or joined every single opinion in those cases over, over the last decade. And he's in the process, it's created a different framework. And it said, is this punishment serving a mean, meaningful penological purpose? And in order to figure that out, we're going to look at what people are actually doing on the ground today, not with legislative bean counting only, but on the ground. And when you start asking that question, and I think Judge Kaczynski said this yesterday, what are people actually doing on the ground? You figure out that it's an incredibly rare punishment. And if it's used so rarely, and if race is involved, and, and then and so rarely and so selectively, 
collectively, how could it possibly serve any penological purpose at all? Can you imagine traffic laws that you're like, every 10 times you run a red light or drive 100 miles an hour, we're going to stop you, arrest you, and prosecute you, and, and, and then give you the fine. It, 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 if you don't get the fine that's available, right, it can't be serving penological purpose. And then he goes and says, well, is there any systemic reason to believe it's not working? And, and when you look at the death penalty today, I won't go into it, but it, l- let me just tell you, in Texas last year, right, uh, Justice Kennedy creates the boxes and says, well, well, juveniles, they're different. Like, uh, people with mental illness, they're, they're different. But when you create those boxes, sometimes what you see is that the boxes illuminate that you're, that you're, you, it changes the spectrum. And you're like, oh, okay, it gives us a reference point. Well, Juan Garcia was executed in Texas last year. 75 IQ score, 18 years old, right? Uh, Robert Charles Ladd was executed in Texas last year. 67 IQ score, lowest 4% intelligence in America. State psychologists from Texas had rather obviously mentally retarded, right? Kent Sprouse, uh, the, uh, mental illness, schizophrenia, the state experts in many, uh, but these people that we execute are actually people that look much more in the average case, like somebody who's excludable because they're intellectually disabled or juveniles than they do to this idea of the, the, the most morally culpable, depraved, you know, calm actor. They just, it's just a myth. Like what we're seeing is just a myth. And when that's not, when the typical case involves the type of features that look like the excludables, right? I think that's something that's going to matter to Anthony to Anthony Kennedy. And I'll just, the last thing I'll say, four justices of the Mississippi, Mississippi Supreme Court, right, uh, said earlier this year, you know, Atkins doesn't make any sense if you just, if you let it exclude somebody who's mentally ill and is almost intellectually excludable. It just doesn't make any sense. Like, it has to mean that it's a level of functional impairment, right? And I'm not saying that's where the court's going to go. I'm just saying when, when you think about people are starting to realize this question, Ginny Sloan uh, and the Constitution Project helped to, to file a brief in the United States Supreme Court re- recently, 10 state Supreme Court justices, six of them former chief justices, including Arizona, Florida, Montana. Um, and those justices said, you just can't administer this because the people we're executing are, look more like the, excul- the excludables than they do like the people that we're supposed to be executing. And when that's happening in combination, irrational exuberance isn't how I would characterize it. I played the bad guy here. <laughs> Quoting Alan Greenspan, I should have known better than that. Um, we want to open this up for discussion. We've only touched on a few uh, basic thoughts about 21st century challenges, many of which were others were mentioned during the symposium. Uh, Steve Bright talked about uh, perhaps that we need to challenge uh, the the peremptory challenges, that peremptory challenges are a vehicle uh, for race discrimination and, and, and that that needs to now be eliminated. Uh, Liz Semmel talked about needing to perhaps re-examine death qualification. Um, both Catherine and Rob have talked about uh, challenges that might extend the protections of Atkins and Roper to uh, similar groups of, of defendants uh, who mental, severe, with severe mental illness or other conditions that exhibit similar kinds of impairments and vulnerabilities. So we have not even begun to, I think, probably scratch the surface uh, of the uh, array of challenges that, that can and may be brought. But what we did want to do is open it up to all of the uh, creative uh, lawyers and, and practitioners and thinkers in this room uh, to solicit not just your questions but also your thoughts. Yeah, Jordan. I think one of the most interesting things about the last 20 years is that three of the most destabilizing issues for the death penalty, um, wrongful convictions, death row phenomena, lethal injection, all three of those things, I think, were not predicted as things that would destabilize the death penalty. I think, you know, 10 years before any of those three things gathered a lot of traction, there would have been a lot of skepticism about all of them. And indeed, there would be more than just skepticism because when all three of those things sort of came to the surface, there was a lot of ambivalence. I mean, people were litigating on behalf of the clients. Rita Radistitz is here with them. who worked on the lackey issue. I mean, people were worried about raising that issue because it called to attention how long people were staying on death row and how long appeals were. People were worried about emphasizing innocence because of the 
obvious possible backlash for people for whom there was no plausible claim of innocence. People were worried about lethal injection because of the fear of the sort of natural comparison between the death that occurred for the victim versus the death that was going to occur for the condemned. And I'm just wondering, just trying to think outside of the box and creatively, I have no answer myself, so I'm just asking the question. <laughs> what other sorts of things out there are we not thinking about that we might have some ambivalence about, um, but that might have a sort of similarly destabilizing potential? Um, you know, if we had had this conference in 1993, um, I don't think any of us would have said lethal injection, innocence, death row phenomena, none of those things would have been the things that we thought were the biggest problems with the death penalty, or if we didn't think they were the biggest problems, the ones with the most potential leverage in terms of public opinion or judicial opinion or legislative attention. And so are there things that are sort of outside of our frame right now that, um, that you know, that might serve similar kinds of purposes down the road? And I ask that, not of the panel, but just right. anyone. Sure. Well, well, any thoughts from the people in the room on that? I mean, I'll throw out one, and I, 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 I was totally probably um, ill-advised since. <laughs> but I mean, I, <laughs> but I mean, I, I think that one one of the things that George Kendall said was, you know, in in one of his early one of the earliest presentations was, you know, just how Greg really didn't change the realities on the ground. And it didn't touch the most intractable problems that were really responsible for the problems identified in Furman, which were defense representation and, I think, prosecutorial discretion. And instead focused solely on jury sentencing discretion. I'm not at all convinced uh, that the greatest source of, uh, that the greatest source of, of sentencing disparities attributable to the sentencer's discretion. I, I'm actually convinced that it's really the biggest problem is the unfettered prosecutorial discretion uh, that they are able to exercise and that it accounts for why my, my client is on death row. And when I read in Westlaw of similar cases presenting exactly the same facts, the defendant was allowed to plead to a lesser included offense. There's no dis distinction between them uh, that, that can account for that other than the fact that in one county the prosecutor made a deal and in my county he did not. And I think in a way it's, it's out of our frame of reference because we've been all taught to believe that that is just sort of unthinkable, that there cannot be any constraint on prosecutorial discretion. And so just don't, don't touch that uh, and leave that alone. And I think since, you know, to the extent that anybody really cares about what's actually happening, not just the, sort of the appearance of, of uh, the, the, the procedural framework, but just actually cares about the empirical realities of how the system is actually not working, then I think we have to try to figure out ways to address that, talk about it. I actually agree and would frame it a little bit differently. I think that one of the things that this weird political um, year that we're having with Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump basically talking about the instability of government and how we can't um, trust government, it's sort of something we know as defense attorneys, exactly that, that the actors control the outcome and that, you know, it's straight white men who are controlling those outcomes because they're 95 percent of the prosecutors. And this dissatisfaction with government in general, I think, kind of goes to your, your question, Jordan, of the next great thing might be to to join forces like Jenny's doing in a lot of other areas um, with the conservative movement of saying we can't trust government to you know, decide whether we should build a bridge here. Why in the world would we trust government to decide whether we should kill somebody or not? I mean, I think that there's a dissatisfaction with government in general that hasn't been here over the last 20 years in as intense of a movement. And m melding that with some of the Black Lives Matters um, conversations that are happening around the country, I think, has shown that there is more of a distrust of prosecution, prosecutors and police than has been apparent in the past. And so maybe that somewhere around there, I don't know what the answer is, because I certainly don't know more than Jordan on anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that there's somewhere in that milieu that there might be the answer. Lots of hands. 
just stay with this question? Well, I think we're just opening it up for general comments and questions okay. and discussion. Uh, this is a little different. Um, so Raul asked, uh, you know, is there irrational exuberance? And uh, I regret that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and Rob, Rob replied by first saying, uh, what we do next uh, doesn't really depend on making predictions about the Supreme Court, which I think is a, a deep truth, and, uh, and I agree with. Uh, and then proceeded to uh, give us an example of exuberance, uh, which uh, may or may not be irrational. <laughs> But uh, on whether to be optimistic or not, on whether we have the second coming of Rudolph, which, by the way, did not lead to the abolition of the death penalty, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, uh, I've heard people on both sides. I'm, I'm agnostic myself. I think, uh, but I wanted to focus a little, just return a little attention on something that uh, is the other side of Rob's exuberance, which is not how you win cases in the Supreme Court, but how you lose cases in the Supreme Court. So, so Rob mentioned Lockhart and opening uh, uh, old wounds, uh, and people who may or may not have argued it. I'm the person who may or may not have argued it. Uh, and I should say, that there are no wounds involved. Uh, we were scheduled to lose Lockhart. We knew we were going to lose Lockhart. And uh, uh, we did as well as we could in Lockhart. I have no regrets about it. Uh, and the reason we lost Lockhart, by the way, in case you don't know, Lockhart is the case, the issue is whether death qualified juries are unconstitutional because they make the juries that are selected more likely to convict the juries that don't go through that process. Uh, and the evidence of this was not only overwhelming and clear, but without social scientific evidence, everybody knew it all along. And everybody knew that everybody knew it. So as an empirical proposition, it was unanswerable. And we lost it by the Supreme Court saying, first, no, you have no empirical basis and a disingenuous opinion, basically dismantling a lot of facts and saying they're not facts. And then, just to make sure that you had a bullet through the head as well as a stake through the heart, saying, uh, if you had proved that or if somebody does prove it in the future, it's not an issue anyway. Okay. Why did we lose in the face of all this? Well, we, why, we knew we were going to lose because... Lockhart, unlike the predecessor Witherspoon, which dealt with death sentences, dealt with convictions, and if we had won, it would be, there would be no principled way not to say it was retroactive, and it would have meant, in theory, the release of thousands of people, most of whom had not been sentenced to death. That's why we lost Lockhart, and we knew it. Okay. McCleskey, it's now clear, in case anybody didn't know, not that it wasn't clear enough from the opinion, but it's clear from, uh, you know, from... Uh, uh, chambers memos that uh, have become uh, available since that the Supreme Court knew that David Baldus and his colleagues had proven discrimination in Georgia, which, by the way, wasn't a secret to anybody anyway, uh, and uh, were not prepared to act on it. Uh, nobody on the Supreme Court in McCleskey or since has ever denied that there is discrimination or that it has been shown by that study. They've just avoided the subject. Uh, why didn't they? Well, we know why they didn't. We've been told by Justice Powell, who wrote the opinion and cast the deciding vote, because it would have meant, at a minimum, outlawing the death penalty in Georgia and probably, as he characterized it later, abolishing the death penalty. Uh, that's why we lost. Uh, uh, we have had the experience of now three Supreme Court justices who, at or near retire or after retirement, have said, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. But uh, and you learn from that. You say, well, gee, you know, being on the Supreme Court and facing all these things changes you. But none of them did this when they had the opportunity to pull the trigger when it would have had an effect. And that's as important a lesson to draw from it as anything else. Uh, so the reason I'm saying this is not because anybody's doing the wrong thing, but uh, it is the way you win cases is not by figuring out how you're going to win. The way you win cases is by figuring out how you're going to lose. And you usually do lose at least. I think the one, first of all, um, I think everybody in the room knows this, but, you know, Sam's research, when I say political, um, and I think the way you win is political, is Sam's research out of, and, and his spouse's research out of Lockhart, uh, and then now out of Innocence, are, are just two of those most, like, important political 
factors that drive people's opinions on the death penalty and I think that are just around in the, the milieu of the death penalty. And I think for me what the difference is, when you talk about Lockhart or McCleskey and you say that in, we, we disparage the too much justice problem, but it really is. I mean, courts have to be able to administer the rules that they create and, 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 and you know, both of those uh, are, are, are difficult to, cases that would have been difficult to administer or would have required something else I think is really important, which is uh, 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 Professor Siegel at uh, uh, there's article anti-balkanization principle describing how uh, describing how Justice Kennedy thinks about race, and, and these those are explicit race-based decisions, and, and, and that does something uh, in a country when it's the explicit reason uh, for doing something, as opposed to like a reason that's in the in the milieu. And I think one that's that's really different. One thing that's really different about the way the court looks at the death penalty today is that those issues are, are tied in or maybe in the background, but the framework for the way the court looks at the death penalty uh, involves something that's incredibly important today that did not exist at the time of Lockhart or, or McCleskey or, or 10 years ago or 15 years ago, which is that on the ground, when we, first of all, the momentum in the country looks very different. Um, and then on the ground, when you start using that indicator, which is such an important part of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence today, like we see that there are 49 death sentences in America last year, which is, the, and the average over the last 10 years is lower than the last 10 years before Furman in a country that has 100 million more people. And, and I think what that does is over a period of time, it shows that like you're not trying to get rid of a punishment on a specific ground that's likely to divide the nation in a time where it's popular. You're trying to get rid of a punishment on a broad ground that takes like in, in, into effect what people are actually doing at a time where it's deeply unpopular. And, and to me, that makes a gigantic difference. That's, that's why I'm agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> I was struck by something that was said on the prosecutor's panel, and I'm trying to reconstruct it, but it was something along the lines of we're winning the moral argument, but we're losing sort of the, the argument on cost. We're losing the more sort of rational efficiency, et cetera, argument. And I thought it was really interesting because it's something that hasn't come up so much here, the moral argument on the defense side. And obviously the strategy that we're talking about and sort of the way that we're talking about abolishing the death penalty has a lot to do with why it is no longer capable of being carried out, but less to do with why it should not be carried out. And it gets touched on, I think, when we talk about race, when we talk about other issues, but, and I think this is something that has often, you know, the people on the progressive side of issues tend not to take the moral high ground. We tend not to be as good as sort of wrangling that side of the discussion. But I wonder if that's a problem potentially that we're facing here and whether, and I, I guess I have a fear that a decision that could come out is going to be something, you know, I think of Roe v. Wade, I think of some decision that has the, has the protections in place but can be scaled back so enormously because the, the moral high ground wasn't, wasn't taken, the moral argument wasn't won. And I wonder whether you think we're doing enough to sort of win the moral argument, whether it's something that we can't put into this discussion because maybe we can't corral opinion on this, um, or whether you think the Supreme Court would be willing to read something like that into it based on the decline in death sentences. So. I think for me as a trial lawyer, the moral argument is not helpful. I mean, in the courtroom. Because I've, I'm arguing to a death-qualified jury. I'm arguing to a judge who's not going to be allowed to sit unless he um, says that he's willing to follow the law. So, for, I mean, in this, so, so making that moral argument uh, apart from the legal argument is like putting gas in a diesel engine. It just doesn't go anywhere. Um, I, I think um, the moral argument certainly has great resonance with me. I think you scratch most death penalty lawyers who do this work. We'd become abolitionists if we weren't to start, um, although I think a lot of us were to start. Um, but as someone who, who feels like you have to be deeply practical about this, um, I'm not the person in a place to make that moral argument because I'm dealing with so many people for whom that moral argument is a non-starter. I could make that argument all day long to Brian, ba Brian Baker, and it's not going to cause him to withdraw the death notice in a single case. And so there's, there's my dilemma there. 
I mean, I tend, I tend to agree, and, you know, maybe this issue more than others, you know, gets at that tension, right? Like, I always have to think about things, like, where, what's, what's my creepy job self think about this, as opposed to, you know, sort of what my person thinks about this. And, you know, I think in, in talking about this and talking to media and talking to, you know, legislatures when we're trying to influence, you know, statute uh, legislation, we can't argue morality because that's not what this, it, it, it actually takes away from the credibility of our issue. So for me to go in and say, well, we can't, we shouldn't kill people at all because we shouldn't be killing people, it undercuts any ability for us to also say, well, if we're going to kill people, we need to make sure we do it, you know, constitutionally or humanely. And so I think you're right. In this sense, I, at the morality, again, I mean, we saw some of this come out in the Glossop argument, um, you know, and that, oh, this is just anti-death penalty, whatever. Um, and it takes away from what are real and credible problems with how things are administered. And, and, and so I think that it's important to talk about the morality of it. It is important to say we shouldn't be doing this at all. But just in this work, it's, it's very difficult to, 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 to do both things because one tends to undercut the other, at least f from you know, my perspective in, in talking with folks. We've got Ginny back there and oh, some other. Wait. Can we get microphones? Oh. And, oh. Ah. Okay, we've got Tanya Green back there. Okay, with the microphone. A um, couple of things. I, maybe it's because I was raised without the Lord in my life. But I, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm totally serious, because I think I define morality more broadly. And I think that the place or a place for morality in the trial of these cases is in the mitigation story. And I think that if we do the work and we insist and I think that that's, that's I, I have a little list of a couple things, of places that we can do better and others again throw against the wall because you know we'll take as much as we can uh, use. And one of them is in the trials. We are better than we were 20 years ago at mitigation, but we are nowhere where we need to be. We have cases still coming out. They put mama on the stand, she cries, death. I mean, it's remarkable what still happens with all this resources that we have now, this internet thing, and um, all of the great history books and all the amazing social science that's out there about communities and the histories and how they've developed and how they've produced some of these guys who are able to do these things to other human beings. To not have those stories in the courtroom, I think is, is a failing that's not acceptable. And I think that that's the place that the morality comes in, because that's the humanity. And for me, as a heathen, that's one of my definitions <laughs> of morality, is humanity. Um, another thought that I have had during the couple of days here is about the potential role of proportionality in legislation and requiring proportionality assessments somehow, that maybe that's another accountability, transparency, conservative ally area that we could push on a little bit with our legislative advocates, um, with our friends in um, legislatures, to see if we can get some legislation moving that requires that. I mean, because litigating, as folks have said, is not, is not gonna do it. It hasn't worked, you know, after the fact, it's kinda laughable. I mean, but you've got co-defendants, one gets death, one doesn't. And, and there are lots of different reasons that we could build into uh, reform and this these this kind of legislation could work in heavy use states to get these conversations going and I really do believe and which is my third point that if we have more conversations at more di more places about this insanity it'll start sticking with lots of other folks and we won't have the row type blowback and we won't have the brown type blowback that undoes you know, the progress that we make in the Supreme Court ultimately because we don't have hearts and minds. I think we can get hearts and minds in lots of different places and these um, are some of them. And then finally I want to say again that I think that we have a responsibility to more fully integrate our effort into the growing, boiling, uh, public, uh, whatever, you know, however we want to describe it, that's happening around 
uh, black lives mm -hmm. around, like I think even the Bernie campaign folks we can use. I think, that they, and, and this is all an offshoot of Occupy. I mean, this is, this is a different generation that's thinking about things differently. We are remiss if we don't think about how to integrate this stuff into, uh, integrate us into them, not bring them to our office and talk about how we can work together, but we go out to the meetings and we are there and we are present and we are engaging um, in much bigger, broader work that if we don't get with them, then they will leave, as I said at a meeting this morning, our violent guys behind. And we can't have that happen because that's not the reform we're looking for. Thank you for that. Some other comments I know. I think technically we're supposed to end at 12.15, but we might have started a little later than we for supposed to, so we, I'm going to I'm going to allocate a little bit more time to run over. I always do this when I teach class too. My students are used to it. Uh, got more comments, Rob and Henderson, and Jenny. I'm sorry, I got I got all of you. Who's got the mic? Uh, I do. <laughs> Walter. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to second everything that was just said, and um, I think reemphasize. Uh, you know, a point I was making on the panel that we had about public health being, uh, I think, a very important kind of moral way to get into discussion about the death penalty. It invites uh, those who are on the other side of the issue to join us and to, uh, in, and to think about the death penalty as uh, a trauma organizing system and, and compare that to other systems. There's, there's, there's also a way of thinking about you know, the Black Lives Matter issue from the perspective of historical trauma. You know, there's a thing that, uh, there's a Portland State University professor who talks about post-traumatic slave syndrome. Um, there, there are ways to, to talk about this that are very practical and moral at the same time. Uh, and I think it's really important that, that uh, we work on those, even if they aren't the kinds of things that we can directly litigate on. Um, and I just got one other thing to throw out because there's so many extraordinary minds here uh, that I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't mention it. Uh, but there's the question of religion and the death penalty. And I raised a claim back in two th maybe 2000 in uh, Brittany Holberg's case here in Texas that the Texas death penalty violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment uh, because the, the House... Uh, in its closing arguments before passing the bill uh, went on at length about, uh, you know, the sponsors, the authors of the bill went on at length about the religious bases for it. Uh, you look at Edwards v. Aguilar, uh, Supreme Court case in Louisiana that talks about looking for, uh, you know, establishment problems by looking at the purposes for a piece of legislation that are articulated by the authors. It's hard to see a difference. So I would encourage everybody to look at their own state legislative records to see if there's something comparable. Yeah, I think that's kind of innovative thinking and argument that is a 21st century challenge to the death penalty. Um, and I've always been a big fan of that one. Um, we have several other comments. Can we pass the mic? <laughs> Ginny, great. Okay. I was really struck by something that uh, Tanya said. We were, we were talking about abolition and morality, and they aren't necessarily the same thing. The, the reason that the Constitution Project tries to stay away from the word abolition is um, uh, because, as Catherine was saying, uh, it depends on who your audience is and you lose people depending on, on who the audience is. But we pick people up when we talk about the kind of morality that Tanya was talking about, the Panetti letter that someone referred to before where we got 30 signatures of these prominent conservatives in support of Panetti it included four guys who had never before spoken out about the death penalty. They're not abolitionists, but they did see Panetti as a moral issue. They saw what was going on in his case as a moral issue. So it really, the framing of this is so important and the, the message in the audience is, is, is where it is. Um, so I think there's a lot of truth in what everybody's been saying. Rob. Henderson. Henderson. <laughs> Rob, do you? Okay. I was just going to comment that uh, the, the observation that this is largely political suggests that not all the answers are in this room and not all the answers can be litigated. And um, 
you know, the role of faith for many of us who are heathens or have not always been heathens. Uh, and we recognize that the con this country was erected on views of religion and faith. Um, and I think what's exciting is to see all of the very many very conservative religious leaders who are coming out for their own reasons for redemption. Uh, you saw Judge Alcala yesterday talk about the way in which she's torn by her official duties and her Christian duties. Um, I think it's a dangerous thing for us as litigators to get involved in. You know, David Brock is involved in a really sensitive piece of litigation in, in, in Charleston. You know, he needs to stay away from a lot of issues. Uh, but that does not stop uh, the community and the victims from speaking about the role of faith and redemption and mercy and all of the things that are consistent with abolition. Uh, and in South Carolina, it's hard to imagine that if, in fact, uh, this young man gets something other than the death penalty, that given that state's history, given that county's history, any death penalty uh, in that state and that county could morally stand. Uh, but that's something that David and his team needs to be as far away from as possible. Uh, but those things are happening. You know, the, the Pope's announcement is having a real impact on people. Those things are happening. Uh, and I think we need to be cautious about how we associate ourselves with those movements. I think what Tanya's talked about uh, in terms of mitigation and making sure those themes are worked in the case, all that's right. But a lot of it has to be picked up uh, by folks outside the litigation community, the, the legal community. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen when we have uh, a former president and two former attorney generals uh, who will be in the political space. And you know, who knows if they come out in two or three years and, and, and take a strong position on the death penalty. If, if that links up with the Black Lives Movement and the last two or three years of reexamination of the criminal justice system, there's no telling where we would be in the next three years. So there are opportunities out there that we're not in total control of. We've just got to be in a space that we can take advantage of. I think we might have time for one more. Is that okay? One more comment? Well, since we're running low on time, let's talk about race. Uh, you know, I think one of, the, one of the problems with McCleskey, apart from it being wrongly decided, uh, is that it's actually smaller than the real issue. Uh, and um, McCleskey was looking at uh, the sentencing statistics as opposed to the entire, um, the entire circumstances uh, in which capital cases are tried. Uh, and I think that there is a time for a new McCleskey uh, that is uh, that takes a very different view of the issue. I mean, you can even narrowly take a different view of the issue and make a difference on the statistics when you say that McCleskey was decided during a time in which victim impact evidence was constitutionally impermissible and the court was operating under the fiction that the jury followed its instructions and didn't, you know, and didn't make decisions based on the race of victim. Now that race of victim is permissible, those statistics uh, are evidence of particularized discrimination that ought to be considered uh, in, in whether a case uh, is or is not uh, unconstitutionally discriminatory on the basis of race. But I think that there are a whole bunch of other things that ought to be going into all of the, uh, all of the race challenges and, and also into the general systemic challenges to the constitutionality of the death penalty. We talked about some of them earlier. Um, the combination of death qualification and peremptory challenges uh, has a distorting effect on who serves on juries, and it's a racially distorting effect. But it also has a distorting effect on racial attitudes, because we know that people who go through the death qualifying process uh, are much more uh, prone to harbor discriminatory beliefs. Uh, and so the death qualifying process is part of the particularized discrimination that we see in any case. Uh, we see over and over uh, animal references and other dehumanizing references, which are code words for race. Uh, and there should be arguing in all the cases in which there are animal references that that is particularized discrimination that's a violation under McCleskey. And that should be bringing in the neuropsychological evidence uh, and all the other uh, types of, uh, of, uh, of, of sociological evidence uh, about 
uh, the history of animal references within the jurisdiction, uh, the, the social history of racism within the jurisdiction, uh, the other use of, uh, of foul racist language by prosecutors uh, within the, the, the jurisdiction. And then there are racial effects from elected judges, uh, and that ought to be uh, part of it. Uh, there's all the evidence of implicit bias. In interracial murders, there's all the evidence of looking deathworthy, that if you have more stereotypically African features, uh, you are much more likely to be sentenced to death uh, than if you had lighter skin and more European features. All of those should be in there. And for identifying particularized discrimination, looking at vague aggravators, like heinous, atrocious, and cruel, or torture. Because the same way that you have the sociological analysis um, of what retribution means, uh, torture uh, and heinous, atrocious, and cruel will very often mean black uh, to, uh, to white jurors. So I think there are all of these things. And we have to add in the social things like police shootings uh, within an area. Uh, the race effects of indigent defense, because we know that, that that's involved. I, I think that's, you know, I was going to say a balanced breakfast, but it's more like a full meal uh, of, uh, of issues uh, that document the pervasiveness and insidiousness of race in all the cases. And the new McCleskey challenge has got to be much bigger than the old one. All right. Thanks so much for those comments. We really appreciate the, the audience joining us and making those contributions. And thank you to my panelists as well for their contributions to the discussion. I think that this just well, demonstrates that we need more time for this issue. Uh, I just want to, I just want to, before everyone leaves, I just want to once again um, thank the organizers of this conference, uh, James Marlowe, Seth Miller, Misty Thomas, Jim Marcus, Molly Spalding, and Ralph Schoenman, and, and, and myself. Yeah. <laughs> We also want to thank all of the speakers and moderators who have devoted two and a half days out of their busy professional lives to be here. I'd like to thank all of the folks who have come and attended this conference and have lasted with us for two and a half days. And I, um, and I sincerely hope that 10 years from now we will not be talking about 50 years after Greg versus Georgia. Thank you. <laughs>